Right, so um, I gave a talk here, or must have been a couple of years now, about Norman Lockyer. So, but I really wanted to uh, introduce his son James, who doesn't really get a, much of a look in. He's, he's uh, um, although of course we name our planetarium after him, there's not much been said about his life. And really, it is as equally as remarkable as, as his father's. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about Norman Lockyer um, as an introduction and then and lead on to James. But you can see their dates uh, 100 years from 1836 to 1936. It's a period in which science was emerging from a uh, wealthy gentleman's hobby to serious international study. And in fact, the term scientist had only been co coined in uh, 1833. So here's a rather less formal pose of, uh, of the Lockyer family. Um, you see it's dated September 2nd, 1912. This was actually a significant date in time because this is when they actually started their observatory um, at Sidmouth. And you've got there, you've got Norman, James, and Norman's second wife, Mary, with their dog, Noel. And we've got to really thank James Lockyer, who was a very keen photographer um, for a wonderful collection of lantern slides uh, from which most of these um, uh, talks are, are, are taken from. And a lot of his slides are uh, labelled WJSL, William James Stuart Lockyer. So just a, a brief intro into the Lockyer family. Norman Lockyer was actually born uh, the year Victoria came to the throne. And his his father was a surgeon apothecary, that's a rather grandiose name for a chemist. Uh, but he was a lecturer and the, one of the founders of the Rugby Literary and Scientific Institute. Uh, Norman Lockyer was more of a, an artist, a linguist um, in his younger days. He was fluent in French, German and Greek. Um, his mother translated... Uh, certainly French books into English, so that's probably where he, he got that interest from. But his parents died when he was just 19 years old, and his first job was a student <coughs> teacher at Western Supermare. However, he kind of made very much a, a big impression on the headmaster, because a uh, year after he started, the headmaster got him a job at the war office in Pall Mall as a second-rate clerk. We know that his, uh, his salary for his first year was £100 a year. However, he seemed to settle in on that, and uh, the job was made permanent the, the second uh, year he was there. And in 1858, he married uh, Winifred James, his sweetheart, and they set up home in Wimbledon. Uh, he was obviously a good administrator. He got involved in the local politics and became on sec of the Wimbledon uh, Village Club. Uh, like many Victorian families, they had a very, very large number of, of children. The two daughters, Rosalind and Winifred, and the sons, uh, Joseph, who died aged two, Norman, <coughs> Frank, who died uh, fairly uh, as a young lad, Alexander, Orman, Hughes Campbell, and William James, uh, known as Jim. And sadly, the mother died in uh, 1879, and Lockyer was left to bring up uh, the five boys and two girls by himself. And he was regarded as the archetypal, strict, authoritarian Victorian father. Now, in the 1950, in 1850s, of course, the Victorians had a great drive for knowledge, progress and improvement. Uh, Prince Albert has set up his great exhibition in 1851 in Crystal Palace. Brunel was busy constructing his railways and his great ships. And of course Darwin had recently published The Origin of the Species. <coughs> the telegraph had led the way to a communications uh, revelation. And uh, the 
camera was a must-have gadget for the wealthy. The Victorian internet, uh, the telegraph had now was allowing you to communicate on the continent and also a uh, transatlantic cable had been laid. Um, so uh, that was going to prove significant, as you'll find out later on, in, in uh, Lockyer's communications. So how did uh, Norman Lockyer became interested in astronomy? It was only by chance. He used to travel each day uh, in the, on the railway to his office in Pall Mall, and he met up with a barrister, George Pollock, who was a keen amateur astronomer. And he lent Lockyer a small three and a quarter inch refractor, the sort of telescope we all start off with. And Lockyer began, started observing the moon. He soon joined the British Association, which was the forerunner of the British Astronomical Association. And he joined a group to map the moon. And this brought him in contact with many of the leading astronomers of the time, um, including Warren de la Rue, uh, George Phillips, William Crookes, and most significantly, um, the publisher Alexander Macmillan. And being elected to the BA, he found himself in company of other influential astronomers of the, of the day. In particular, Sir John Herschel, he was now the elder spokesman of science, of course the father of William, although he was now in his 70s. We also had Lord Ross, the fourth, uh, the fourth Earl and of the wealthy and distinguished family from Parsonstown. And his father, of course, had built the what's known as the Leviathan of Parsonstown, the huge six-inch reflecting telescope erected between two castle walls. And another important uh, astronomer was the Reverend W.R. Dawes. He was a great observer of Mars. Uh, he was called the Eagle-Eyed Dawes. In 1862, Thomas Cook lent Lone Lockyer a six and a quarter inch lens, which he mounted in a paper mache tube, that was the Victorian equivalent of fiberglass, supported on an iron frame. Thomas Cook was an amazing character, the son of a shoemaker in, in York, and uh, he only had about two or three years schooling, but he went to the library and he taught himself basic physics and he made uh, his first telescope lens out of a bottom of a whiskey glass. That so impressed all his friends, they asked him to make them and he ends up uh, starting a telescope factory and he produced telescopes that were sold all around the world. Getting back to Lockyer, Lockyer observes a transit of Titan across Saturn and he proves himself to be a good draftsman. Here's his drawings of Mars at a perihelic opposition. And a comment from Dr. Phillips, who is professor of, of geology at Oxford. I'm delighted with your drawings, result of a noble lens and good eyes and hands and a real love of the work. I must say that your drawings are the best I have heard of. Um, uh, Wiley have uh, now digitised a lot of the Lockyer collection, the Lockyer special collection here at Exeter. Um, and there's a wonderful entry I came across, the first entry of Lockyer's observing book, dating 1862. Now, it's a bit hard to read his handwriting, so I I've, I've, uh, can read it out for you. <coughs> Having now, by the blessing of God, obtained the means of, I hope, believing in doing good work in astronomy... It becomes necessary to start a book in which to record my observations, such at least as I considered worthy of record on paper bien entendu. For besides that which is jotted down by the pen, there will be infinity to be treasured up by the mind. This too may be put on record some day. My instrument is a refractor of 6.25 inches aperture and 98.68 inches focal length. An object glass is a triumph of mind and skill of its maker. I take it secundus nulli. And of course he was referring to his wonderful six a quarter inch refractor 
that is in daily use um, today at the observatory. Uh, in 1865, he gets promoted to the War Office. He was entrusted uh, with editor of the Army Regulations, and that gave him increased salary and funds a new home in Hampstead and a new ob observatory to house his telescope. In those days, the work in the War Office was not that arduous. They would start by 10 in the morning and finish at 3 in the afternoon, which gave plenty of time for Lockyer to uh, follow up on his uh, research into solar astronomy. And he became fascinated by the sun. And here's a wonderful drawing of, his, of the sun showing a, a dark sunspot um, and what we'll call a, a light bridge. And he purchased a simple spectroscope from John Browning and began observing the solar spectrum. And he writes, May not the spectroscope afford us evidence of the existence of red flames which uh, total eclipses have revealed to us in the sun's atmosphere, although they escape all other methods of observations at other times? Now, what we did know about the Fraunhofer lines uh, at that time, the dark lines and then the dark absorption lines have been discovered by Wollaston in 1802, Fraunhofer had catalogued them, but it wasn't until Kirchhoff and, and Bunsen realised that these were absorption lines uh, caused by all the different elements. So by examining the solar spectrum, you could work out what the sun was made of. And Lockyer wanted to work out what the solar red flames were. And he applies for a grant for a seven-prism spectroscope, and he has success on the... 20th of October 1868, he captured his first solar prominence uh, from the unobscured sun and was able to show that it was composed of hydrogen. So Lockyer had developed a means of observing solar prominences um, outside of a solar eclipse. And he writes, I saw a bright line flash into the field. My eye was so fatigued at that time that I doubted its evidence, although unconsciously I explained, exclaimed at last. The line, however, remained an exquisitely coloured line, absolutely coincident with the line C of the solar spectrum, and as I saw it, a prolongation of that line. Leaving a telescope to be driven by the clock, I quitted the observatory <coughs> to fetch my wife to endorse my observation. What he didn't know at the time was the French astronomer Pierre Janssen had also discovered hydrogen uh, just a few months before during the uh, solar eclipse of uh, 1868. And he saw nine bright emission lines from the chromosphere. And these were first identified as lines of hydrogen and sodium. Because he knew where that prominence was, he was able to repeat the observation uh, the next day. And by quirk of fate, <coughs> both discoveries were announced to the French Academy of Sciences um, on the same day. Janssen had written a letter that took uh, two months to arrive, and uh, Lockyer had news uh, the telegraph. So a gold medal was struck, honouring both Janssen and Lockyer, and thus both received worldwide acclaim. Lockyer then teams up with the chemist Edward Franklin, who provides spectra of all the known elements on the Earth, which Lockyer used to identify atoms present in the sun. And <coughs> he identifies sodium and calcium and barium, but there was this mysterious uh, yellow line which didn't correspond to any known element at that time. And Lockyer names a strange substance after the Greek word for the sun, Helios, and he calls it helium. And he had to wait another 27 years until it was discovered on the earth uh, by the Scottish chemist William Ramsey from the mineral Cleveite. So by now uh, Lockyer had made a name for himself um, and, of course, as I mentioned before, 1860 was a time when science was emerging from uh, a wealthy gentleman's hobby. 
And Lockett's friendship with the publisher uh, Alexander Macmillan led to a development of a weekly scientific magazine called The Reader, with Lockyer as its editor. And this brought him in contact with many of the leading scientists of the day, including Charles Darwin, Thomas Huxley, and Alfred Lord Tennyson. These were days of Alexander Macmillan's famous uh, tobacco parliaments, where science, art, and hot topics of the day, such as Darwinism, would be discussed. Uh, he had his talk, Tobacco and Tipple on Thursdays group, which fostered great uh, friendships among the, the <coughs> scientific education, educators of the day. By 1869, Lockyer was now at his zenith with these discoveries. <coughs> However, the reader was a, uh, a failure uh, it's financially and it uh, ceased publication. Lockyer had a nervous breakdown and uh, Alexander Macmillan funded him for a six-month holiday in the south of France. But when he returned to the war office, he found his salary had been halved. And to supplement his income, he began writing books and he approached Macmillan to start another weekly science journal, uh, which, of course, they called uh, Nature. And this was the first edition, November 4th, 1869. And Lockyer used one of the quotes of, of uh, William Wordsworth on the frontispiece. To the solid ground of nature, trust the mind which builds for eye. So in the first edition of Nature, Lockyer writes about the solar red flames. This was the August uh, eclipse in the States at that time. And he writes, it's only within the last decade that modern science has shown to everyone's satisfaction by photographing them and showing that they were eclipsed as the sun was eclipsed and did not travel the moon, that the red promises really do belong to the sun. It was only a hundred years earlier that Edwin Halley had insisted that the solar promises were part of the lunar atmosphere. By now, Lockyer was making a name for himself he had uh, left work at the War Office and he got a job as Secretary of the Devonshire Committee. This was uh, now promoting science, teaching and education and uh, Lockyer was first director of the Solar Physics Observatory at Kensington and here he is um, on the steps of, uh, of his office. So that's uh, a little bit about uh, Lockyer. I well, now want to mention a bit about his illustrious son, William James. <clears throat> Born January 1868, this would be the year that Lockyer made his discovery of, of helium, and he died uh, July 1936, walking back down the hill uh, from uh, the observatory. Jim Lockyer was the fifth son of Norman and Winifred, and of all his sons, Norman took uh, most interest in Jim, who actually <coughs> followed his father into an astronomical career. Jim studied both at Cambridge and uh, South Kensington, but he was sent to Gottingen in Germany uh, to get his PhD. <coughs> Jim tells us that his interests outside of astronomy were fast cars and aeroplanes. Um, on this photo he took, uh, uh, he says, this is my Lancia car and one of my eight Bristol fighters for strafing the Hun. He actually started his aeronautical career in ballooning with his good pal Francis McLean. There's a wonderful picture of seven ballooning enthusiasts of November 1908. The balloon was uh, owned by uh, Francis McLean. And uh, from this balloon, Jim Lockyer made lots of photographs. Uh, here he is flying over Buckingham Palace. Uh, they used to take off from uh, West London. Hopefully the prevailing winds would take them over London and they'd land somewhere flat uh, like the, of the Isle of Sheppey. Now I must mention a bit about Francis McLean because he's also a co-founder of the observatory having donated... Uh, £10,000 when it was first set up. 
He came from a very wealthy engineering family. Um, the firm had uh, designed the Suez Canal, built Dover Harbour, drained the fens, and built the Furnace Railway, and also had coal mining interests. There's a wonderful photograph that Jim Lockyer took uh, of a chap called Percy Pilcher. In fact, he made the first ever movie of an airborne man. The very sad <coughs> ending to this, uh, <coughs> this picture. In 1897, Percy Pilcher had designed a motorised version of this, what we would call a hang glider, uh, a few days before he was going to demonstrate the powered version, he took this up for a flight. A gust of wind blew him up in the sky, the aircraft stalled, um, and Percy fell to his death. But had his powered version uh, succeeded, he would have beaten the Wright brothers by six years. Which leads me on to this photograph. Uh, it's called The Founding Fathers of Aviation. Um, in the front row, you've got Wilbur and Orville Wright. Stand behind them uh, with a pipe, we've got Frank McLean. Frank McLean had uh, met up with the Wright brothers, invited them over to the UK. Frank had actually bought this farm in, uh, on the <coughs> Isle of Sheppey, it was Muswell Manor at Laysdown. Uh, it was a nice flat piece of uh, ground, uh, ideal for uh, launching aircraft. Now Frank had set up, uh, invited the Wright brothers uh, <coughs> to grant the Short brothers, Oswald, Horace and Eustace, who used to make their balloons on the railway arches of uh, Waterloo Station, uh, granted them a licence to make uh, the Wright flyers. Uh, Frank McLean says, any aircraft you can't sell, I'll buy. So Frank McLean ends up with 13 aircraft, <laughs> and he donates two to the Royal Navy. Um, so if you go to the Fleet Air Arm Museum, you'll see Frank McLean regarded as the godfather of the Royal Naval Air Service. In the front row, sitting next to... Uh, um, Orville Wright, you've got the Honourable Charles Rolls of Rolls-Royce fame. Sadly, he got killed in an aircraft accident a year later uh, at Bournemouth International Air Show. Um, he was diving too steeply in his right flyer and the tailplane snapped off and he fell to his death. In the front row uh, to the left, you've got Moore Brabazon. He was the first guy to get a UK pilot's licence. He also famously took a little pig up in his uh, aeroplane to prove that even pigs could fly. But it was very hazardous. The early pioneers... <coughs> uh, Moore Brabazon never got over the death of his friend Cecil Grace, who took off from Dover, and he got lost in a fog bank and couldn't find his way home, so he was lost at sea. This is an iconic photograph of uh, Jim Lockyer holding on tight and Frank McLean at the controls of his uh, right flyer. This is dated November the 6th, 1910. <clears throat> There's no health and safety in those days. They weren't even wearing goggles. <laughs> uh, this is a wonderful uh, photograph of the receipt that the Fleet Air Arm gave me uh, of... Um, Receipt from <coughs> the Wright brothers for Frank McLean's first aircraft for £1,000. £1,000 in those days probably worth about 70000 today. Um, here's a wonderful newspaper cutting. British scientists here on a solar eclipse expedition, June 1911, with uh, Frank and, uh, and Jim Lockyer, um, with uh, Orville Wright. I'll just read a, a part of it. We're here in just a few, <coughs> for a day or so, we stopped off to call on Mr Wright, whom we, we, we met abroad. We will continue late Monday night, or Monday morning, to the Pacific coast, where we will take the boat for Tonga Island, 
in the South Pacific where there will be a number of international men of prominence in astrological circles. They got that wrong, didn't they? <laughs> in answer to a question as to what the astronomers expect to find out about the corona, Mr Maclay <coughs> said, oh well, we just like to know what it's made of. Now on their way uh, to Tonga, they stopped off at Yerkes Observatory and they met up with the famous... Um, Professor Barnard, of course, of uh, Barnard was the re uh, director of Yerkes then, had an amazing life. He was regarded as an astronomer who never slept. And apart from uh, all his dark, nebulous objects, Barnard objects, he discovered galaxies and one of the fastest moving stars in the sky. Also, of course, they stopped off to meet the, the Wright brothers. Here we are from uh, Jim's photo album showing uh, Orville about to fly. Of course, flying was very much a rich gentleman's hobby. Uh, although the aircraft would cost about £1,000 to, to buy, the annual running costs of a shed, wages and repairs all mounted up. And that shows typical flying costume of that time. <laughs> Another iconic photograph is this uh, uh, Frank McLean's uh, Nile, uh, sorry, not Nile, um, flight under Tower Bridge, in uh, <coughs> where he flew his uh, float plane under the span of, of Tower Bridge, and he lands outside uh, Westminster. August 11th, uh, 1912. Uh, promptly approached by the river police who come up and fine him a pound for causing a breach of the peace. Uh, a few years later, he uh, used the aeroplane to penetrate deepest, darkest Africa. He flies up the Nile and he lands 16th of January uh, at Aswan after stopping at Edfu for petrol and smoke. It wasn't without incidents. He had 13 breakdowns on the way. Uh, the trip took 13, about 13 months because he actually had to uh, send off a new piston rods that took about three months to uh, arrive. So around about this time, of course, that they actually established the Norman Lockyer Observatory at, at Sidmouth with two main telescopes uh, the Kensington and the Maclean. And the main work of the observatory was, of course, in stellar research, and uh, the large refractors uh, were fitted with objective prisms. Uh, Frank Maclean, uh, Frank Maclean Sr. was Norman Locker's uh, contemporary. He was a keen spectroscopist, and his son Francis uh, donated his uh, father's telescope after he had died, and that had been set up his family home in, uh, in Tunbridge Wells. This is a typical example of the spectra they were recording on their photographic plates, the spectra of Nova Cygni, uh, 1920. So Norman uh, Lockyer dies in 1920, and James Lockyer takes over as director, and he renamed it the Norman Lockyer Observatory in memory of its founder. When it was set up, it was originally called the Hill Observatory, being located on the top of Sorkham Hill. And you can see here a photo uh, Jim took from uh, his aircraft. He's uh, promptly put in a little landing strip um, so that he could uh, land his plane there. I must mention... <coughs> Both father and son went on eight eclipse expeditions. Norman writes, there's no question the total eclipse of our central luminary is one of the grandest and most awe-inspiring sights given to man to witness. And here he is loading up his horse and cart, departing uh, to the port, which would involve a, uh, a lengthy sea voyage to get there. It was akin to sending a man to the moon uh, today. He used to take a huge number of people. Um, as many as 150 personnel went to India 
They included public works department, subordinates, masons and carpenters, uh, people who put up tents, huts, photographic dark rooms, and of course you'd need all your uh, messing arrangements for your food and cooking and security guards uh, <coughs> from the natives. This is an a expedition to northern Norway on HMS Voyage in 1896. Um, Lockyer was a good organiser and he uh, entrusted the whole of the ship's company to carry out his experiments. But unfortunately you see a rather baleful looking Lockyer. And he writes, sadly all that effort was in vain. The eclipse has come and gone and we are homeward bound rather depressed but satisfied that the Volage and ourselves had done our duty and it was Dame Nature alone who was to blame. Um, here's another eclipse expedition. This is a wonderful photo record that Jim Lockyer had taken. Of course, this was the UK eclipse of June the 29th, 1927 at, at Richmond in North Yorkshire. Um, here's a wonderful poster put up. Norman Lockyer observed in Sidmouth, South Devon, reserved by kind permission of the Marquis of Zetland. This was on a little site uh, uh, where there was a folly called the Oliver Ducket. And you can see here uh, Frank McLean's Rolls Royce and his tent. And look at the extent to which they, uh, the equipment they used uh, to set up. These were the supports for a big 31-foot uh, solar coronagraph. Uh, there it is erected, and you see it actually had to be erected at the right position for the sun at that right time. It was an early morning eclipse, about uh, 5.30 in the morning. Um, and here is Frank McLean is plus fours, um, the guy Leston Smith with his trilby and his cigarette looks just like J.R. Oppenheimer. <laughs> Uh, there it is set up, and another shot. <coughs> Frank's group of instruments and my instrument on the ducket on its shelter, he writes. We've got a wonderful photo, rec uh, photo album of, of all these photographs. Here's Jim uh, Lockyer and a chap called Bill. Again, this with a German aeroplane camera. Uh, a lot of the cameras were using uh, aerial reconnaissance lenses from uh, World War One, And you can see the sort of state of the weather conditions. They're here they all are in their gabardine coats. Remember, this is June in Yorkshire. This is actually eclipse day. Um, you can see it's pretty cloudy. And again, they were clouded out. Here's uh, Jim Lockyer with a, a camera of some sorts. The guy seated is his chauffeur, a chap called Ricketts. Um, here is his wife, Kitty. She operated uh, the Zeiss coronagraph. But I said, unfortunately, it was cloudy on the day. This is a Jim Lockyer smoking his pipe and setting up his eclipse pendulum. Timing is, of course, very important uh, for these events. I don't know if many of you have been on eclipse expeditions but you generally have a guy with a whistle and uh, giving you a warning uh, 30 seconds before the uh, the uh, the moon moves across the sun and the sun flashes back but here we have two gents with a megaphone and a stopwatch a chap called Chapman and Mackay sitting on the ducket uh, giving timings of, of uh, first and second contact but as I said, the eclipse was cloudy, although it was seen from Giggleswick. Uh, and this is the only photographs of the partial phases that they got. Um, here is success at the Norman Lockyer Observatory using the McLean photograph, but of course it's just um, the partial phase. I uh, must include this photograph. This is Frank McLean's caravan circa 1927 being pulled by his uh, Rolls Royce. Of the Lockyer sons, uh, the gentleman on the, on the left is Ormond. He emigrated to Australia and started sheep farming. 
Hughes Campbell, standing next to him, joined the Royal Navy. He was decorated the Dardanelles for bringing his ship uh, close into the shore so that all the uh, soldiers could embark safely, but sadly got court-martialed a few years later for being drunk in charge of a ship. And uh, Jim Lockyer, seated, was the only one, of course, to follow in his father's footsteps. Jim Lockyer was a very keen astrophotographer. This is a state-of-the-art meteor photography in 1899, using four or five uh, plate cameras on a weight-driven equatorial for tracking uh, the possible Leonid meteor storm of 1899. Unfortunately, it wasn't a storm that night. I must include some wonderful portraits uh, that, that Jim includes in his uh, archive collection. Um, the Lockers had a holiday home, Westgate on Sea. Um, this is uh, Jim Lockers' photograph. Uh, I think Rosie, this was the sister um, and a friend called A Study in Feet. Here's another shot of her feet. <laughs> And, of course, Jim was very keen on motoring. Uh, lots of photographs of these wonderful old cars uh, yet to be identified. Here's Frank McLean's uh, Rolls-Royce at uh, some meeting. So Jim Lockyer married Kate Wright in uh, 1921. Uh, and although they were quite elderly when they got married... Um, they didn't have any children, but they did adopt uh, a nephew. Uh, Kate's sister died shortly after giving birth. And uh, they adopted a young chap called Desmond Cleave. And there's a wonderful collection of, uh, of uh, postcards that Jim Locker had, had written to this young boy who was at school on Burnham on Sea. Uh, each, of the post, each of the postcards included a drawing of a bird or an animal. I'll just read uh, the bottom one here. April the 30th, 1933. A beautiful Sunday morning with misty, uh, with a few struggling clouds. I've made a large diagram showing where the heath fire started, worked around the observatory, uh, and where it started. There was, the observatory nearly burnt down in 1933 from all the gorse. Uh, in May, we have a flying circus at the hill uh, for a whole week. Hope you're all, can't read that, much love, um, he used to sign his, uh, all his cards as um. 1932, we had a new telescope set up the observatory, it's called the Mond Equatorial. It was uh, funded by Robert Mon. Here's a wonderful picture, a picture of Jim Lockyer seated on the steps. We still have those steps. It, can, it uh, was four aerial reconnaissance cameras uh, from World War I mounted on a, uh, a giant equatorial. It was funded by uh, Sir Robert Mond, who was the founder of ICI, a good friend of Norman Lockyer's. And uh, in the uh, inauguration ceremony, you've got uh, R.G. Aitken, director of the Lick Observatory, and Sir Richard Gregory, who took over from the editorship of Norman Lockyer of Nature and Jim Lockyer. And here's a photograph of, of a typical wide-field shot of the Pleiades taken in 1932. Um, Jim also writes an article, here we are, dated... Uh, this would be in 1895 when uh, uh, Ronchon has discovered X-rays. This the actual plate is an X-ray of Jim Lockyer's hand, which was given to us a few years ago. Um, and Jim Lockyer writes a, an article about X-rays in this edition of, uh, of Nature. Lastly, a few Christmas cards from the NLO. Uh, this is Frank McLean's Christmas card of 1911 with every good wish for the new year from F.K. McLean. And Jim Lockyer uh, used to send out an annual card. Here he is, uh, a seasonal greeting from W. 
uh, J.S. Lockyer, embodying some of the pleasant flying retrospects for 1910. So you've got his balloons there, his famous flight with uh, Frank McLean. And this one in particular, 1913-14, uh, as usual, Dr. W.J.S. Lockyer sends us a unique reminder of the season. So this time his greeting taking a, a, above the interesting form of Marconi gram. So this was a Marconi gram, and I must mention the famous Marconi telegram that Marconi has sent to uh, Norman Lockyer, very best regards, sent by etherways through space from Canada to England, Marconi. To which Lockyer replied, your ether telegram received with thanks, help from meteorology by telegraphing Atlantic barometer, Lockyer. And he follows that up with a letter to the Times, um, stating, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad to say today I received the following message from Marconi by wireless telegraphy. Thanks for suggestion, hope to be able to do soon. Big Westerly Gale here Monday, Marconi. I'm sure that all friends of science will be grateful to Mr. Marconi for generous and invaluable assistance, which will undoubtedly be of enormous advantage to British meteorology. And uh, just of interest, here's a postcard from uh, to Major William J. S. Lockyer, Hill Observatory, Sidmouth. It was sent 1921, and it arrived 100 years later. <laughs> It was uh, for spectroscopic and magnitude observations of Nova Cygni, 1920. Well, I knew the post office was bad service, but that takes a bit. <laughs> so, our lantern slide collection is a very valuable resource showing the remarkable and varied lives of great Victorian adventurers and entrepreneurs of that era. And uh, Beatrice Steele, here of Exeter Uni, has recently been awarded a collaborative uh, doctoral award for researching into the scientific and cultural significance of our lantern slide collection. These images of flimsy aircraft from 1909 were the latest technology of their time. Although they look as though they came from a bygone era, remember it was only 112 years ago and since then we've landed on the moon and can now send civilians into space. A period of just 87 years separates these photographs of man with his feet off terra firma. Lockyer's lifelong quest was to advance and popularise science. Our aim at the NLO is to continue that work. Thank you very much.